Hello, my dear friends, my dear fellow Californians,、uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. When I say back, I'm talking about the theory, talking about California for the election season.、Uh, during this election, the summer of 2018, I call it very critical because、uh, the way we look at California, I found it. I feel it very, very much of a trepidation. Uh, everywhere you go, everybody you chat about, right? So,、uh, legislator for the 120 of them, there's a big chance. I say, my friends say, lots of my friends say, a majority of them, or big number, at least a big number of them, are either corrupted, or not doing the job, or or not doing the right thing. Or even in the worst case, not in their right mind. I trust me. I have proof to back up. Jack Shaw is not a liar. I have lots of things to prove、right, that they are out of their mind. Today, however, to cut the chase, I have my good friend, a big man for California, for California future, the candidate for California. Secretary of State of California, Mr. Mark Moiser, here joining me, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me today. On behalf of my crew, on behalf of EDI, and on behalf of California or Californians who think their stuff straight. How about that? Well. Again, thank you for for having me here today,、uh -huh. and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about the issues that are going on with California and why I'm running for Secretary of State. All right, very good. Normally, I explain to everybody as a start. I ask only four questions: number one, who you are; number two, what have you done to make yourself so proud of yourself? Number three, what are you planning on doing once elected? And number four, why you? Why Sounds like four good questions that、yeah. we need to discuss today. You want to start with, with one? Start with one. Who is Mark Moiser?、Mm. Uh, Mark Moiser is an election law constitutional attorney.、Uh, that's how I make my living. But I also I love history. I love the great outdoors.、Mm. You know, whether it's bicycle riding. Hiking, sailing, scuba diving—I love being out in the great. You、California. do all the dangerous stuff. I, I wouldn't say it's all dangerous, but you know, we we, we do get out there and enjoy、uh, enjoy life. All right. But、uh, as an election law attorney, most people have not, you know, don't have never heard of such a thing.、Mm -hmm. uh, an election law attorney. I was one of the first attorneys that was flown into Wisconsin and Michigan、mm -hmm. during the presidential recounts in 2016. So 2016, we had、uh, a presidential election, and Jill Stein raised millions of dollars to do a recount in Wisconsin and Michigan. And I was、mm. one of the attorneys that went out there and watched the process to make sure that those people who cast ballots, that those ballots were properly counted, and that there had been no hacking of a machine or、mm. no tampering with the machine, and thus. A machine giving a wrong vote count. So that is, you know, just a little bit of experience. Did you get? Oh, by the way,、uh, please allow me a little insertion. You go.、Right. Did you get a chance to study? Is it lawful to make your proposition or measure in a language so mystifying that you use a double denial or triple denial, whatsoever? I joke with Mark Ang, my friend of mine, the other day. I said a question could be a bill, could be a measure, could be a proposition. Do you think it is not a right to deny that Jack Chow is not a handsome man? Am I handsome or not? I'm going. I'm going to stay get, away from that one. Did you get, did you get lost? Did you get lost? <laughs> that you had enough du、uh, double and triple、uh, negatives、yeah. in there you to 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 mystify the whole thing. Exactly.、Right? So that language, seriously, oh, seriously, oh, I just now said you used to get involved with all the dangerous stuff. This is the dangerous stuff because your voters get lost. 
So let's, let's step back for a second and why you asked that question is because the Secretary of State is the chief election officer of the state. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people are very concerned with the politics that have been coming on with ballot titles. You know, state of California is one of the uh, states out there that allows the citizens to gather enough signatures to put something on the ballot. The only thing is it is the California Attorney General who gets to write the summary of what that bill mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And so you can have a bill that says one thing, and if the attorney general doesn't really like it, he can play with the language of the summary so that it sounds like a yes vote is really a no vote, and a no vote is really a yes vote. Does the Secretary of, of State, does the Secretary of State has the supervision power in him to make sure things are properly text? Unfortunately, the part that you are concerned about deals with the ballot summary, and that is the exclusive authority of the Attorney General of the state of California. So while I'm involved with many aspects of the ballot proposition, the part that you are concerned about really has been the politicizing that's been coming out of the Attorney General's office and I as a citizen of the state of California also have the same concerns that you do that they have so politicized the ballot titles mm -hmm. but unfortunately um, I don't believe that there's much I can do at the Secretary of State's office because that is a duty and responsibility that the voters have given to the Attorney General as the Chief Election Officer of the state. Very good. I mean, as Very the Chief good. Attorney right, of the city. And of course, of course we, we don't want to bring all the crying baby to you single-handedly. We're talking about if there's any chance to help my audiences to clarify the job duties for uh, as, 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 as state, uh, Secretary of State, right? That will be uh, warmly welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what is the job duties for uh, Secretary of State? Well, the Secretary of State, as I've mentioned a couple times, is the chief election officer of the state. That means they're under federal law, state law, U.S. or state constitution. There are, they are responsible for maintaining the statewide dat database of voters. They are responsible for election day procedures. They oversee the 58 counties, and the 58 counties actually execute the elections. But it's the Secretary of State that lays out the policies and guidelines of what the counties have to do and how they mm. properly follow election law. And if there are problems, it's up to the Secretary of State to make sure that the counties are actually following election law. Then they are responsible that, you know, the counties count their, their ballots and the counties are responsible for auditing their ballots but the secretary of state is responsible for certifying the voting machines that we use they're res responsible for doing independent investigations outside of the counties mm. so that way you know if the counties are actually doing their job right are, are mm. the counties actually following election law mm. and you know so the the secretary of state maintains the database and works with the counties to make sure that when you go to vote on election day one, are you authorized to vote? Two, are you, you know, make sure that you're able to vote and then make sure that the vote that you cast was properly counted mm -hmm. and that no outside influences were able to hack a machine or were able to manipulate the vote through unlawful means. So that's under elections, that's what the Secretary of State does. The Secretary of State is also over multiple registrations in the state. So if you're an entrepreneur who wants to do business in the state of California, the first government entity that you will interact with is the Secretary of State yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. to register mm -hmm. your business. And mm -hmm. so who's your, on your board of directors? That's going to be filed with the Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. Also, it's going to be over a couple other registrations. You know, the Secretary of State is over uh, notary public. So if you want to be a notary public, that goes through the Secretary of State and miscellaneous databases like that. It's also over the state archives. So we, you know, 
so you're over the elections, you're over business registrations, notary publics, a lot to do with the laws. You know, after the legislature passes a law, the Secretary of State is responsible for putting all those laws in a book and allowing people to be able to access them. It's called codifying the law. You know, the chief over the state archive, so, you know, you know, they're the keeper of the state seal and stuff like that. So official duties is more the secretary of the state. They're the keeper of the state's records mm -hmm. with the, also the duty of being over the election. So that's what the secretary of state does. And they're responsible for interacting with the, the people of California, running the databases and making sure that when you're interacting with the state of California, mm -hmm. that the records are properly kept. All right, thank you very much. All right, uh, my dear audience, the lovely audience, the ladies and gentlemen, uh, today is one of the very, very rare chances that we have. We brought an important man to you. He is the candidate for California, for State Secretary of California, uh, Mr. Mark Moiser. Uh, Mr. Mark Moiser has been uh, uh, a businessman successfully ever since he was a, a 15. And at age 17, he bought his own pizza store. I, my son, learned to tie his own shoelace at the age of 17, I guess. All right, good. Anyway, uh, for that man, okay, now, I have a lot of questions prepared. In addition to my normal W's, four W's, and let's take a break. We will come back. We will go one by one with the questions specially designed for him. Please, stay with us. Hello, dear friends, my lovely audiences, uh, dear fellow Californians. Welcome back to the show, Jack Chow on the East West Show with the GNE TV. Today we are touching base with you for another seat that possibly needs a change of hands, that is Secretary of State for California. With me is the candidate, and he is number two of it, right? Uh, Mr. Mark Moiser, I like him. I like uh, his him starting from, from the point when I started doing his uh, homework, right? Check his background. Now, question. What has or what have benefited you when you started to be successful in doing business at a very young age? Well, my parents installed into me a work ethic at a very young age where, you know, I, you know, they, they didn't just give me what I wanted. They said, oh, you would like this? Well, you're going to have to go earn the money. You know, when I wanted a bicycle, a 10-speed bicycle, it's like, okay, you have to pay half of it. We'll pay half of it. And mm. I needed to go out and raise the money. And so I became an entrepreneur at a very young age because I realized that if I wanted to go on bicycle rides, if I wanted a nice bicycle, I needed to earn that money. So whether it was raising orphaned animals and sell, you know, raising them, selling them, making money that way, mm. whether it was having a street side stand where I picked mm. cherries in the morning and sold it in the afternoon, whether it was making crafts and selling that, it's like I figured out at a very young age that if I wanted to buy something, I had to first go and earn it. And the best way to earn it was to find needs in the community and to meet those needs. Does that mean that early experience make you, made you tougher, smarter, more durable, or anyway, what has benefited you? Well, I mean, to, to get started at a business at, at in such a young age, you know, really, you know, you just start that education that much earlier, mm -hmm. you know, rather than waiting until you're 25 and out of college and maybe you start in the business community. And you were, you were hired on a managerial position at age of 15. Yeah, age 15, that's, I was already assistant that's manager. That's incredible. Age 15, they know nothing. They know Nintendo game. That's it. Well, uh, I, because of all the entrepreneurial experience that I had, it, uh -huh. I, I was able to move up the chain very fast. 
Okay, well, let's move on to the next question. How would you compare money gained while doing business successfully and experiences obtained during the same period of time thereof? Well, I mean, to me, mm -hmm. money is a tool. You know, I earned money so that I could do things, whether it was, you know, at age 12, being able to buy my first 10-speed bike, you know, so I could then get on a bike and ride a, to the that, library. That's and a go miracle read. already. <laughs> you know, and mm. so I could go read or what the books that I wanted to, you know, do. Mm. You know, later I saved money to buy my own restaurant, where I had my own restaurant at age 21. Money is a tool, and, you know, earning money is, you know, I don't earn money just to have money. It's, you have to have goals in life. You have to have desires. And so I don't see, you know, oh, just I want to be a billionaire. No, it's like I need this kind of resources so I could go do, you know, do this. And so right now I'm uh, running for secretary of state. It costs so much money to do so. So, you know, it's the, the goal is not money. Money is a tool. All right, sounds a uh, very profound philosophy. Very profound philosophy. The other day with a friend of mine, we were talking about now the economy is good, right? Lots of young people off uh, fresh off uh, high school, they want to start going to a higher education to get a huge loan burdening them from that point on for almost the rest of their life, or majority of their rest of their life, though, so they'd rather, they'd rather start something like you did. You bought your own pizza store 17, age of 17, and you were successful, considered businessman, successful at the age of 21. And then, with the money, with the experiences, that's why I'm asking you yeah. to compare the money and the experiences, which you equipped yourself up, and then you went to law school. Yeah, law school. Going to law school or becoming what an attorney beautiful. was, what was a, a second arrangement. career. It was a second career for me. I'd already oh, well, a second career. Yeah. yeah, I'd already had you know mm. what, uh, ten years in the restaurant business by the time I went to law school. You're right. 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 But that's because I started mm. you know business at such a young age. I you know had you know been in the restaurant industry at such a young age that by the time I even went to law school, I'd already been in the industry, you know, mm. I'd been in restaurant for 10 years. And, you know, I had went, I had a whole different perspective of why I was in law school than most of my classmates who were seven, you know, eight years younger than me at times, so. Mm. Okay, very good, very right, good. Obviously, you were, you were, you have portrayed a, a unique model that probably lots of young people could follow, right? And now, I have the following descriptions of politicians. Okay. Right? Number one, they are uh, the career politician who do politics for a living. Oh, otherwise, they are they're starving. Yeah. Right? They do politics for their milk and the bread. Right? And the two... And the two means the politicians uh, who understand business and are with a reasonable knowledge of some money, how money is made. And number three, business people who either are chosen by politics or sneak into politics. Yeah. So they decided to do a politician. Among the three though, how do you pick? How do you, what do you recommend Californians pick and why? That's a yes. bigger question that has to be answered in each of the categories, please. Well, let's, let's start with your first category, somebody who's been in politics their entire life. That could be like a John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States. By age 14, he was already a secretary to an ambassador in Russia for the United States of America. You know, he was Secretary of State of the United States. He became president, then he went back to Congress for 16 years. Yes, there were times in his life that he had a law degree, but because of, you know, over 50 years in government, he was a 
you know, there were people who hated his guts because he did he stood for principle over party. He's a notorious for but, for his presidency. Uh, but know that. Yeah. they respected him because you know mm -hmm. they understood he knew what he was talking about. His uh -huh. father was a second president, the one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. Now on the far other extreme, you got somebody like Donald Trump, who was an mm -hmm. successful businessman who then became president of the United States. And so you're, you're, you're talking about which one is better and, or which one should people be looking at. And there are advantages to both. And you all, almost need to look at what is the current situation and are, are the people in charge doing their job. You know, I'm running for Secretary of State, the chief election officer. I'm running against the Democrat incumbent. He's held the position for the last four years. Before that, he was in the Senate, and you know he has a long political career. But let's look at what his record is right now. According to MIT, which just did a study of all the states in the union, looked at all the elections across 17 different measurables, they found that California elections are the third worst in the nation. Mm. That is a failing grade. So mm -hmm. MIT has given California elections a failing grade. Sometimes if you are a career politician, you get so caught in the rut that you mm. can't think outside the box. And if you can't fix the problem, mm. maybe it's time to bring in somebody with an outside perspective. That's what the nation decided to do with Donald Trump. They felt like that terms like the swamp you know, the Washington, D.C. swamp mm. were being flown around this country. People felt like Washington, D.C. could not be fixed by another insider. Knowing all the ins and outs was not going to fix the problems. You needed somebody outside the box. We are seeing that California elections for the last 10 years have consistently been ranked in the bottom five in the nation. We don't have proper uh, security cybersecurity on our websites. We don't have proper protections of our voter registrations. Our voter databases are in absolute shambles. We have mm. problems with uh, our military being unable to vote. We have high provisional ballots, ballots not being counted. ACLU is suing the state because 45,000 people mm. in the state of California had their ballots uh, not counted. Mm. So when you have this kind of problem, and you've been electing nothing but insiders for the last 20 years, it's clear that the insiders can't fix the problem because they, they don't know how to approach it from an outside problem. That's where you want to bring somebody in like me. I happen to be, have been involved with politics since I was 14 years old. So mm. I understand what's going on. Mm. Even though I haven't held elected positions, I've been active in the political community. But... I've been out there in business. I've been out there in law, whether it's doing uh, election law, constitutional law, representing business clients. I've had to go out there and think creatively to find solutions to problems. And so rather than bringing in a career politician who wants to hold the seat warm while they wait for an opening for you. Right, very good. Let's cut here right away for another segment. Okay. And it looks that we really need to go into it. Uh, that reminds me of talking about the uh, past June election, and there's lots of questions to talk about. So stay with us, please. Hello, dear friends, my lovely audiences, my dear fellow Californians. Uh, it is the critical moment because we're talking about real California stuff. We're not talking about New York. We're not talking about Mexico. We're talking about California, Euro California. With me is the candidate for California Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Mark Moiser. Uh, with him, I'm starting to feel a little bit why the past June election was so mystifying. Why after that, in the aftershock, there are lots of complaints, right? To elect with amongst the insider was the most criticism 
they talk about, right? Take the uh, the LASD chief election, for example. Lots of abs absentee votes were not counted, so on and so forth. There are holes here and there, here and there. Just nobody can get onto. Do you think you will get into? Well, that's why I'm running to be Secretary of State and why I was recruited to be Secretary of State because mm -hmm. I was approached by some election law attorneys. They go, California has the third worst elections in the nation. We need somebody who understands election law, mm. who's had to be in court on election law, who's had to be in recounts. We need somebody from an outside perspective to come in and really fight to clean up the problems that we have in California elections. Rather than coming in and say, we have no problems with California elections, which is the current incumbent, you know, his position is there is no problem. Mm. I'm coming in saying, we have a lot of problems, we need to take care of these problems, we need to fix these problems. So, the, like the problem that you, you happened here in LA County, 118,000 mm. people were removed from the voter rolls because of a printer error. And now we have long since found out it was not a printer error, it had to do with data base management from the Secretary of State to the LA County Register of Voters, how they did not properly test the software before they rolled it out, which caused 118,000 people to be removed from the voter Somebody's roll. negligence. Yes, and it was from the Secretary of State. It's and yet, it, uh, it invades democracy. Yes. It, 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 it invades the, the accuracy of a democracy. It, right? it jeopardizes those individuals who came in, and I was talking to somebody yesterday. Yesterday night I was at an event and one of those 118,000 people came up to me and said, I was one of those people who showed up at the polls mm. and was told that I'm not registered to vote there. And she had to fight for her right to even cast a provisional ballot. I mean, the, the mm. poll workers mm. didn't even understand election law to the what point. What county was that? This was right here in L.A. Uh huh. All right. Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we. This is. This was a real live problem. And what was interesting is she is a landowner. She owns an apartment complex, and she actually looked at who was registered to vote in her apartment complex that she owned. And there is a saying that uh, this election could be orchestrated. How big do you, do you think is the chance? that somebody orchestrated the past election. Well, I'm not, I'm gonna always say that they're both sides of the aisle. There are always people who are trying to get out their base to vote. You know, whether it's, you know, whether you're working on the phones, trying to encourage your people to show up, whether you're going and knocking door to door, encouraging pe more participation in the process, there's nothing wrong with getting out the vote. Now, whether somebody cast an illegal ballot or whether somebody is illegally playing with voter databases, um, that is a whole different issue. And if someone had intentionally, and I have not seen any evidence that anybody intentionally knocked 118,000 people off the voter rolls, it's Pure incompetency is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing mm. incompetency mm. and negligence, but that's completely different than intentionally depriving somebody of the right to vote. Mm. But the thing is, the Secretary of State is in charge of our elections. They're responsible for the integrity of our election process. Mm. And as such, you need to be super careful. You know, measure twice, cut once. You know, a stitch in time saves nine that we have many of sayings and the current Secretary of State, he's just throwing new laws and just rushing into new things, whether it's the motor voter or whether it's the registering of youth. These are, have good intentions, but good intentions can lead to disaster if you don't properly test databases and don't properly make sure that they're going to be rolled out without problems. Somebody problem. tends to blame the, uh, the polling machine. Yes. So do we have an update system or, or our system is obsolete? 
Well, LA has LA County has one of the oldest voting machine systems in the United States. Mm. And about a couple weeks ago, or a couple months ago, LA County, after the June election, actually voted to introduce a new voting system that will be implemented over the years. Um, I do have some concerns with the system that they have implemented because it has not yet been certified in the United States or in the state of California. So they are designing a brand new system that has never been used, has not been certified. It's gonna be created for LA County. And sometime in 2019, that system that's being designed will come before the Secretary of State and they will actually test to make sure that that system is going to fulfill California laws. We'll have to see what they design. Uh, there's concerns about this company, who owns it and everything like that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, what's important for the Secretary of State when they come to certifying the machine is, does the machine full have proper security? Does it fulfill California laws? Is it going to meet the needs of the voter? And that's what the Secretary of State is going to be looking at in 2019 when LA brings this new system up and says, here's our new system. LA needs a new system. It is so ancient right now. It's, as I said, it's one of the oldest systems in the entire United States of America. So it does need to be updated. Uh, it's surprising that they're trying to create something new versus actually take something that already has worked. You know, even thinking of the most conservative way without having to understand too much about the technology, though, we know it is time of uh, IT, right? It is time of chips. Yes. Now that the chips can do the most of 10 times complicated, more complicated job, why can't they do a better job in the polling? Well, there's a lot of problems when it comes to IT. You mm -hmm. know, the banking community has had to, through trial and error, has had to figure mm -hmm. out, you know, mm -hmm. proper security so uh -huh. that way you can transact mm -hmm. uh, money online. Uh, the problem is governments sometimes can be a little bit cheap. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not as uh, diligent as the private market, you know, because for whatever reason, they is oh, top level security cost a billion dollars, but low level security cost a million dollars. Well, let's go out and tell the voters that we saved $999 million. Mm -hmm. But in reality, if you don't have proper security in place, you jeopardize the voting system because you create loopholes for outside interest to manipulate the vote. Exactly. And so banking, you know, because they are a private entity and they're, you know, they're going to get sued if they lose your money, they have created very high standards of protocols for technology. And what we have seen is that when states have moved into technology, they do it some quite often in the cheapest way possible because they like to be able to go out and tell the voters that we saved so much money. And sometimes being cheap is not the most responsible way. And they and and then when voters start seeing problems, I mean, we've been dealing with technology for almost 18 years. And every time there's a problem, now voters are really concerned about using technology because it can be hacked or, you know, 11 year old hacks a county website and changes the votes. And people go, oh, well, I don't want to use technology if it can be so easily hacked. Well, the problem is instead of bringing the hackers in like the banks do, they hire white hat hackers to find their vulnerabilities, and so they fix them ahead of time. Unfortunately, what we have is secretaries of states going, oh, that's not a real life example. They're shunning the technology, and they're not listening to those people who are experienced in finding the loopholes, and they're just kind of trying to come up with solutions that are sometimes don't actually solve the problem, and they actually create more problems. So yes, we know that technology exists, that we can do our elections, but we have to also make the commitment to have the proper security and the proper measures in place. So that way, no, one, no outside interest can come in and penetrate the system and destroy the, the, the vote of in any the of the argument of which technology uh, is to use though, do you see, or is it possible, some group interest in it? related? Well, there's always going to be anything, anytime government does something, 
there's always going to be somebody who has an interest in it. Mm -hmm. Whether it is a business who's designing the software, or whether it is a political party, or whether it is a special interest, anytime government's doing something, there is always someone who gets a, a benefit mm. of that. That's why it's important that when you spend government money, that A, you spend it wisely, you actually solve the problems that you're going to solve, make sure you look out for future problems and make sure you properly take address those issues. Mm. But then the purpose always of legislation, the purpose of always doing things is here in the United States, our constitution is we the people. We the people are actually the government. And it's the purpose of the government to be serving the true government, we the people. Mm -hmm. So as Secretary of State, my focus always needs to be on, are we solving the voting problems here in the state of California for Californians? Not, well, if I enter into this contract, it's gonna benefit this person who makes a contribution to, to my party or anything like that. That's not what the duty of the Secretary of State's office is to help outside interests. My duty, it's to we the people. That's very good. That's very well said. I like this statement. I like the my duty versus the we the people. Uh, stay with us. We'll be right back. Hello, my dear friends, my lovely audiences. Welcome back to the show, Jack Chow on the East West Show with GNE TV. Today I have my good friend, Mark Moiser, joining me. He is the candidate for California Secretary of State. After talking to him for three segments, I started to, to understand him a better, in a better way, and I started to understand the Secretary of State position in a better way. And also I understand why during the last election there are lots of complaints. Everything point out that, number one, if we need to save money, there are lots of better ways to save, not by doing so, by reducing, reducing the quality of service, by reducing the accuracy. Right? Now, when we want the job done, we want the job done perfectly to the benefit of we the people, right? For that, we believe it is time to send somebody there. So question, once you're elected, what will you do? Especially what will you do different from others? Okay, I love that question. When I'm elected, and that election day is November 6th, so it's gonna be here before we know it. Uh -huh. But as I started off in the program of talking about the various aspects of what the Secretary of State is responsible for, I mentioned that they're over the voter registration rules. Voter registration rules are the foundation of every good election. Why is that? Because it helps the voters know where they're supposed to vote and make sure that they can't vote multiple times mm -hmm. in different precincts or multiple times in the same precinct. So voter registration is a foundation Right now, we have a problem in the state of California with 11 counties with over 100% voter registration. How do we fix that? Mm. It's called database management. Now, earlier mm. this year, there was a lawsuit, and the state of California filed a brief with the United States Supreme Court in which they said there are 11 different government databases that can be used to clean the voter rolls. But the state of California is only using three of the 11 databases that they said that they're allowed to use. One of those databases is the Social Security death records. I think we need to use the Social Security death records so that if you pass away, let's say in uh, Colorado, uh, your name will be removed from the voter registration rules. Mm -hmm. That is one of the first things that I want to do is I want to take those various government databases and start comparing them to our voter rules. Mm -hmm. And that way, if you are no longer alive, you're no longer registered to vote in the state of California. If you have moved from the state of California, we remove your name from the voter rolls. 
If you are not a citizen of the United States, then we will remove your name from the voter rolls. And the reason why that is so important is because if you are a green card holder and you end up voting in a federal election, when you appear before a federal immigration judge, they can deny your citizenship and they can deport you. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Mm -hmm. And so it is critical that the Secretary of State actually clean up the voter rolls mm -hmm. on a regular basis to remove from them those people who are not authorized to vote. Because if you are a green card holder and you receive in the mail balloting material from the state of California, you're gonna think, oh, I must be allowed to vote. The state sent me balloting material. But the fact that you vote is going to be, it, it could cost you- On record. Dream. It could cost you your dreams. And you could end up going back to the country mm -hmm. after spending years in the United States doing everything you can. Mm -hmm. So it's important that the Secretary of State actually goes in, cleans up the voter rolls, so that way we don't create victims of those people who are trying to become citizens of the United States. So my first priority is to clean up the voter rolls so that only those people who are mm -hmm. eligible to vote mm -hmm. are able to vote. The second thing I want to do is I want to use my office of Secretary of State, mm. I have the constitutional duty to investigate our elections. And I want to actually investigate our elections. Mm. I want to investigate who may have cast um, illegal ballots. I want to uh, make sure that we don't have outside interests or special interests manipulating our vote through a hacking of machines or through illegal means and I want to do proper investigations and if we find some if we find evidence that someone has hacked a machine or if we find evidence that someone has used illegal means to suppress a vote or to uh, cast illegal ballots then I want to start prosecutions of those so the Secretary of State is has the investigation and then the other thing is, as I mentioned earlier, we have these 17 different measurables that the MIT has measured our elections and found that California has the third worst elections in the United States. I want to take those 17 measurables. I want to see the ones that we are doing very poor on, and we're going to start improving in those categories, like our military ballots. Right now, only about 30% of our military overseas ballots actually get returned whereas the national average is about 70 percent so we are over half or we are under half of what the national average is when it comes to our military voting in the state of california and i've had many military personnel tell me that they never even received their ballot so that they could vote so what we need to do is we need to work with the military to make sure that our those people who are fighting overseas for to preserve our rights and our freedoms are able to cast their ballots and so it's stuff like that and we're going to do using the the role of the secretary of state to investigate we're going to look at all these 17 different categories and the ones that we're short in we're going to investigate those areas and then we're going to propose changes that we can do to improve our elections so that when that study comes out in the future we will be able to say we have made progress we we have worked to improve our elections and it's not gonna be just me investigating. I'm gonna open up the doors and we're gonna allow groups on the right and groups on the left to come in and say, Are, is California actually following California election laws? Are we following? I mean, when you have ACLU suing over 45,000 signatures or ballots being thrown out, that is a problem. We need to be able to say, what can we do to fix that problem so that if you co-vote, your vote is not thrown out because of some machine saying your signature doesn't match. Mm. I mean, if, if it wasn't you voting, then yeah, that shouldn't count. But if mm. that was you voting, uh, we need to fix that problem. And so it doesn't matter whether it's the Judicial Watch lawsuit, which claims L.A. County has 144% voter registration, or the Bernie Sanders supporters who want to audit an election because they think that, they're, that the machines may have been tampered with, we need to restore integrity in our election process. And it starts with the Secretary of State being a sheriff of our elections and mm -hmm. saying there are people who want to manipulate elections for their own personal advantage, and we're going to investigate 
and we're going to prosecute to the full extent of the law so that way when Americans and when Californians come to the polls to vote, if they're authorized to vote, they are able to vote. And if they vote, their vote is going to be counted in accordance with what they vote. In between for. what you plan to do and also what is pre prevailing now, where do we stand? Uh, last time I went to um, the DMV, uh, they told me there is a called Real ID program going on. So what is that? Is that related with you, what you want to do, or nothing related? The Real ID is a problem because of California's low standards in giving out voter IDs. You know, you don't have to be a citizen to get an ID. Federal government says, if you're going to be coming into a federal building, if you're going to be flying on a plane, we need to know who you are. Mm -hmm. And so we are no longer going to accept California's IDs because they have not, they're not proper IDs. They're not properly identifying who the person is. And so as such, the federal government said, here's real ID. And if you want to come into a federal building, if you want to, uh, if you want to fly on an airplane, you have to first either A, live in a state that has a proper ID, or B, get one of these real IDs. And so that is the world that we live in. I mean, when, when California legislature has not put up the proper uh, guidelines to get your regular driver's license, it creates problems for the rest of the world. We don't want another 9-11 to happen because California has lax driver's license standards. And so mm -hmm. the federal government, in order to protect its citizens, said, okay, you want to fly? You got to prove who you are. There's, that's, you're going to need a Some citizens ID. prefer, I hold on to my passport. Yeah. That's it. So I don't need a real ID. Would that, is that still acceptable? Yes, uh, your passport or uh -huh. a pass, you know, passport cards don't work in an airport, but uh, you're having a passport though, carrying your passport, if you want to carry your passport, you are perfectly, that's a perfectly valid ID uh, mm. to, to get on a plane. Oh, I see. And this prevents the green card holders, right, who has an ID in some kind of a atmosphere and it goes in to start to to vote, to fake to vote? Well, real ID, you know, state of California does not require you show ID in order to vote. So having, whether we have real ID, mm -hmm. that's not going to have any impact on our elections uh, because California does not have voter ID standards. I mean, if you have, you know, there are some states that do require a uh, voter ID and that's a whole different issue of whether, you know, what IDs are valid because some have very low standards and some have very high standards. But uh, what we're dealing with on Real ID, it really is a federal issue of going through an airport or going to a federal building. All right, very good. Uh, my dear friend, my lovely audience, my dear fellow Californians, uh, it looks that the California will get better because we are expecting a new hand there as the Secretary of State. I love so, your optimism. Yeah, you would have 30 seconds to wrap it up. Will you please, including your website or uh, any support or numbers on so forth? Well, thank you very much for having me and listening to what my vision is for the state of California. If you'd like to find out more about my campaign, go to markmoiser.com. That's M A R K. M-E-U-S-E-R dot com. You could also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you want to follow my campaign and see about what we're doing around the state of California. But I believe elections matter, and that's why I'm running to be your next Secretary of State, and I encourage you to get out and vote this November 6th. Very good. So, my dear friends, thank you for watching, and please go out and vote. And thank you for sharing. Thank you for having me.